Hello there, welcome back to the Agostino Zynga show with I, your host Agostino Zynga and this is episode number 632, that's 632 of the Agostino Zynga show with I, your host Agostino Zynga. I hope this podcast is finding you well wherever you may be, wherever you may be. Well, I am doing well, it's doing pretty decent, I'm not going to lie, everything going great as per usual. The only thing that's kind of upsetting me this week has been this disastrous news I got through my inbox regarding my local gym. I go to like a local borough gym type of thing, basically like a leisure center. It's not basically, it is a leisure center and it's really, really affordable. I think I pay somewhere in the realm of like 23 pounds and I basically get access to this gym from 6 a.m. to 4 p.m. without having to pay. And if I want to go after 4 p.m., you have to pay like seven pounds. But that 25 pound that I pay for 9 a.m. or 6 a.m., sorry, to 4 p.m. access also affords me the ability to book swimming lessons, to book classes like spin and all this other stuff. So it's really, really, really good value for money because most gyms will actually add, ask you to sort of like pay extra for those add on classes. But randomly, I got an email from my inbox today telling us members of the gym that it's going to close from the 22nd of December. Check this out the 22nd all the way until January 6th. So even if you was one of those losers out there who's like, oh, I'm going to do a new resolution. I want to change. I don't want to be a fat bum bum. I don't want to be a skinny mini. I want to bulk up. I want to slim down whatever way you want to go. Or I just want to maintain the way that I am. You can't do that if you don't go between, you know, now and December 22nd until flipping June 7th which is absolutely insane. I've never seen it happening before, but I guess they have to do a lot of um, repairs and whatnot. And this is the only time they're going to have in the calendar, really, if you think about it, to have some dedicated time to do whatever repairs and refurbishment needed to do, because I don't imagine any other time outside of, you know, Christmas where you can do such a thing. It kind of reminds me about retail. I remember one of my, you know, funnier moments of like realizing retail wasn't for me was when me naively asking one of my best managers I've ever had at Dr. Martin to big up Andrew and coming up to him and saying, oh yeah, when are we, are we going to get a break or are we going to be off? Imagine me being this naive. I asked my retail manager, like an absolute boss of retail manager, a guy that legitimately like showed me the purpose of hard work and taught me to respect jobs and stuff and just had a really good work ethic about him or work ethnic as Brenda Job would say I remember me asking him one day oh are we gonna get bank holidays off like public holidays and him looking at me like are you dizzy and then I think that was also the same time that I asked him something about oh well our Christmas day hours like or Christmas hours like because I'd imagine maybe at that time I was talking to too many of my office friends or people who worked in design studios and stuff and they were saying oh yeah we're closing for the holidays all this sort of malarkey and I went back to my store thinking hey man are we gonna do the same thing it's like no the only day retail closed retail shops are actually closed is christmas day especially in london especially like pre-pandemic this must have been like when was i working in that store this must have been at 2017 or something so when you know the when the country was bustling and when london was at its busiest the only time a store would legitimately close would be on christmas day every other day throughout the year is open which is absolutely crazy to think about it, right? That's what, 364 days in the year is open. But on that one day, Christmas Day is not closed. And I'd imagine there's some big execs out there and boardrooms of different retail chains and high street outlets and stuff who are thinking, you know what? Maybe we should be opening on Christmas too. We should be servicing those customers because I know in my hood area, there's always a local boss man open on the Christmas day. Like you can go to a chicken shop on a Christmas day. Sometimes the Chinese, um, Indians, um, you can sometimes go to off licenses and get, you know, booze and other bits and bobs you need to do. Like there are plenty of boss men to open on Christmas day. So that whole adage of like everything closes was definitely not something happened, but obviously now with things changing with the economy being the way it is and the prevalence of people shopping online, a lot of places don't stay open that long anymore. And there's also been an uptick in like antisocial behavior after hours was where stores where retail no where off licenses are allowed to open out you know after 12 a.m there's usually a lot of kind of trouble around there because you get a lot of people basically using off licenses like a kind of makeshift bar and you know the one thing people don't like in london or in the uk overall is people having fun and loitering outside people don't like that they just hate it so there's always going to be complaints from the neighbors and then slowly but surely they're going to take away the person's license and they're going to make you close earlier than you did before because i had certain off licenses where i lived in certain areas of london that basically be open 24 hours from friday to sunday with some exception of maybe 
you know the odd month here and there but they'd basically be open 24 hours a day from friday to sunday so you could be coming back steaming from a heavy night of sessioning out there in the flipping cold and then suddenly <laughs> you come back and you see this flipping off license shiny open you're like oh my god i have to go so clearly that's gonna be a situation that might end up continuing on from places to places but i don't know man that whole leisure center closing at flipping that early it just really really got on my nerves I was like god almighty man I want to I want to actually be in a gym I want to train I don't want to consistently be outside all the time it's just annoying I hate when they do stuff like that it really doesn't make any sense but again I kind of have some sympathy for them because when else are they going to do their refurbishment what they need to do it's a prolonged period might as well take advantage of it but I would have preferred an opportunity to have gone throughout the entirety of the festive season but now I'm going to have to legitimately do what I was doing prior prior and kind of go outside and be working on the flipping public jungle gym thing that we got near us here which is pretty sick but god man i'm not, i really wanted to be open for longer but hey what can you do i've become a little bit expired also i'm not too sure what's going on with me but i haven't been out in a long time it's been a while since i've been out and i'm not too sure if it's just me being expired if it's me being over it if it's just things outside i'm not really that great um, or maybe it's just the weather because as much as i enjoy winter and i enjoy jacket weather because i have a lot of jackets a lot of really nice expensive jackets a lot of cool guy jackets as i would call them right the kind of jacket you're hoping someone compliments you on because you spent 400 pound plus on this flipping camo jacket that just looks like any other camo jacket to some other person who doesn't know anything about fashion but to the fashion heads they know oh that's that camo jacket from that supreme season <laughs> that i have freaking free of so i have a lot of jackets and i enjoy it but god almighty man the cold has been really kicking my ass when it comes to going out i bought maybe four tickets in the last what couple of months and they've all gone to waste because i didn't basically go out i think i've given i've given away a couple of them don't don't get me wrong that's been pretty nice to be able to kind of you know give somebody a little free gift and say hey here you go enjoy yourself because i've obviously received some of them myself but it does feel nice giving things away i'm not gonna lie so that's been pretty nice to be charitable but it is a bit of a bummer man i'm buying tickets for events then the day comes around i look outside my window i'm like oh i could just stay home and have a little bit of a sesh right get on it that way put on the flipping boiler room stream and just chill at home or whatnot and i've basically been doing that instead of actually going out which has been a bit of a weird one but I don't know, man. I don't know if it's me being expired, like I said, if I'm just over it or things are getting the way they are or or what I might end up doing actually going forward because I'm going to go to Berlin, hopefully in the new year to go see Rene Wise play at Bergheim because I want to see that, you know, experience that on the main floor. So I'm really looking forward to that. That should be an absolute blast. But I was thinking when I went last time, I know all the time, you know, the time before last where I kind of was complaining and whining about it right, on my podcast. And I think I put a video out there that a lot of people who got it regularly weren't too happy about. Like, oh, it's so crap. It's not even so great. It's just a clap doing that whole, like, you know, I was going through my, um, it's not that big of a deal stage. I think everyone that goes to, goes out a lot or goes especially that like and will have that stage where it's like oh it's not a big of a deal i mean people make a big deal out of it it's just like any other club it's like yeah but you know it isn't that's why you go there that's why you make the effort to leave your house to pack your bags to put your flipping heavy new rock boots on and to get all cool guy looking out so you can go and vibe and party and have a good time you love it it's clearly i love it and i've talked about this place all the time and i probably won't stop talking about it to the end of time but i remember one epiphany that i had when i was there i was like you know what maybe i should start doing what i was doing prior where I was limiting all my nights out to special events. So that would be seeing like a big time DJ play somewhere in London or basically saying, hey, every three months or so, I'll pick out a random date and I'll go Berlin and have a blast, right? I'll go to, you know, I go to Oxy, I'd go to flipping Paloma Bar, I'd go to Bergheim, I'd go to all these different places and just have a blast and then come back and just live a somewhat mundane, non-meditative sort of life. And I didn't really do that for the longest time. I kind of started just going out to too many nights, like just random ones that weren't really that important. I was not that serious just for the sake of it. And then I would complain why I was getting burnt out or why I was basically feeling like I was kind of over it because I was, I was basically overdoing the going out. And it doesn't even mean overdoing the drugs and the alcohol because 
I've kind of learned how to balance it pretty well. I've been out numerous times for numerous stretches, completely sober. So it's not even a fact of that I need that stuff to get going. It's just more so when you have too much of a good thing, it can get a bit, you know, you can get a bit over it pretty quickly. Like I don't go to private views anymore because there's a period in my life where every Thursday, every last, every first Thursday, every last Friday, I'd be going to some private view and necking back wines and trying to pretend like I'm cultured and stuff and looking intelligent and all that wallaki. And after a while, you get get a little bit bored of it and you stop going unless it's something that you actually want to go to to kind of you know unless it's something like you actually want to support or gallery that you want to go and visit or you're just bored one day but there'll be times that we go in there every single week and it gets boring after a while same would go with clubs so i think going forward especially with it being a new year it might be advantageous for me to start using that approach going forward because i would actually like to have to have to have that happen because at the moment i feel like i'm at the best of time to sort of do that because I'm currently not obsessed with just going out for the sake of it. Do you know what I mean? I, I go out to have fun, to listen to music, to be, hear people play, but I'm also going out to enjoy the DJs, to enjoy the ambiance of it, to meet random people in the smoking area, follow random people, add to random people on Instagram, all that sort of stuff. That's really cool. I enjoy that side of it. So it's not always the kind of blacking out, getting so faded and smashed, whatever, so I can kind of, you know, forget about the horrors of my everyday life because my everyday life aren't as isn't as bad as it probably was in the past where I was doing that. So that's definitely something that I'd want to take advantage of because like I said before, you know, I have a far more healthier relationship with nightlife than I did beforehand. Talking about healthy relationship with nightlife, it's coming up to New Year's Eve, New Year's Day. I know a lot of you are probably thinking where to go. I'm not too sure where I should be, especially if you're in London. And it's difficult. Even if you are in a city outside of London, doesn't matter anywhere in the world. I'm sure New Year's Eve and New Year's Day are always a horrible time to go out. So is, you know, Halloween and all these other big events that should be pretty decent, but usually end up being the, the worst. And I think I really... I only realized this when I was promoting. I think for the longest time, if you're just a punter, you just assume, or not, maybe you're a punter. Maybe if you're somebody that doesn't go to these, you know, bait nights too often and you mostly do your clubbing or you're going out sometimes between the days of like Tuesday and Thursday, which a lot of smart people do, you just bang it out in the weekend and you spend the entire weekend just chilling, relaxing, doing cultural stuff and whatnot, getting your mind right, working on other bits and bobs or whatever it may be, or going out to eat in nice restaurants. But a lot of people who have advanced the levels of nightlife thing have basically decided that Thursdays and sometimes the Tuesdays sorry to Thursdays or Tuesdays to Fridays are usually the best times to go which you know rain kind of clocks back to that I love McConan song going up on a Tuesday which makes a lot of sense now you know the older that I've got but one thing you realize when you start cup promoting is that those days that should be big money earners usually aren't because there's so many different options out there people can choose Halloween and New Year's Eve New Year's Day being a big example but also if you actually smash it and you get it right you can make a killing it goes two ways it's really difficult to kind of get your head around it but it can go two ways very 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 quickly so it's hard to kind of pass which is the best thing to do for me in previous years when i have been you know willing to go out and party the ones that have been the best have been the occasion where i've been able to go to a house party somewhere where i think one year i went to this kind of person's house and they cooked an amazing dinner and then we kind of welcomed in a new year with drinks and watching the fireworks and whatnot from this person's balcony that was absolutely amazing um we did another thing where you saw fireworks on this person's rooftop which was pretty sick and all this was amazing and that kind of revolved more so around like being around a small group of friends in someone's home loads of food loads of drink but it wasn't really like a boom 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 hands in the air party sort of vibe i can't remember the last time i had a good new year's eve in terms of a rave it's been a long time probably because i stopped going for a while but the last time i could think of an actual party that was sick new year's eve might be when one of my friends prior like a long time it must have been at like 2017 2016 put on an amazing warehouse event somewhere in like london bridge they hired this really cool location like underneath some in some arches under a bridge somewhere that was cool you had to knock on a door to get in crawl through this little door you have to you know you have to be invited and whatnot friends of friends type of vibe they had a full setup in there full light show smoke machine all friends playing and whatnot and it wasn't you know hard techno or anything it was just like you know fun new year's eve type music loads of pop records loads of r&b loads of disco loads of house loads of jungle loads of ukg all that good stuff was playing and it was a really really fun time and i think if i'm not mistaken it was also byob which is crazy to think right imagine doing something like that nowadays but that was really really fun i had a good time going to that one but apart from that i kind of put them to bed but this year 
with you know me not going to Berlin this time around and just kind of saving that experience for maybe later in the new year this event from fold for unfold new year's day is seeming like a pretty good option i'm still on the fence like i said i'm not the biggest fan of going out new year's eve new year's day i'm sure most of you adults out there are the same i think if you're a child it's probably a good excuse to go out because it might be the only one time where you're legitimately allowed to go outside and you don't get your parents have been abusing and flipping you know blowing up your phone line checking where you're at they kind of give you a bit more room wiggle room to kind of enjoy yourself and have a good time if you get the excuses in earlier and you stay you say you're staying at a certain person's house who they like that might actually help in terms of your you know amount of time you like to stay out that can obviously go a long way but if you're an adult you know it's hellhole to be out there but considering how great unfold is or how highly regarded it is because again i still haven't been to one yet despite me going to the very first flipping fold party and going to fold essentially for every month you know for most of the year i still haven't been to one unfold yet basically because you know I have a IRL life that I have to kind of keep in somewhat balance. And usually when it comes to Sunday, I'm already wrecked on the Friday and Saturday that I've been out. But from what I've heard, Unfold's amazing. And Unfold, basically the premise around it is that it's their kind of friends and family night, it's kind of an unofficial resident night. Even though they have a resident night already, that's called Resistance that I've been to. I think I went to two of them. I think, and I think there's, I think they might be on the fourth or the fifth, not too sure, but they've got a residence night called Resistance, but they've also got Unfold, which is kind of like an unofficial friends and family residence night. But it also gives them a good option because sometimes big DJs will come and play in London throughout the weekend, but they won't leave maybe until the Monday because sometimes the flights out on the Sunday are really expensive. I know this because I'm always, you know, I'm one of those psychos that checks you know a certain djs like ra sort of like events listings and stuff and see where they're at and then kind of googles or goes to instagrams and find out the you know the club where it's at what the vibe is like i'm one of those kind of weirdos so i know a lot of people you know that play in these type of places that come to london especially would usually leave on a monday or a tuesday so if you've got good connections with them or you know them personally or they're just you know a fan of the club in general because i feel like a lot of djs are big fans of fold and what they've done in kind of the space and the crowd that it attracts because it's maybe the only club we've got in london outside of the promoters who put on great nights it's the only probably base um where you actually see club kids right which which is great to see and people legitimately go out dress up and stuff make an effort to go and dance and sweat their faces off and it's kind of a good vibe to kind of be around or whatnot especially a lot of that younger energy and whatnot so a lot of those bigger DJs who come play on the weekend will sometimes play at Unfold, but it will all be unannounced because they don't reveal the lineup, which is really cool. So you usually go down on a Sunday, it's usually 12 to 12, so you've got enough time to get the last train home, especially I think the Jubilee line still runs at that time, if I'm not mistaken. You maybe can, you know, grab it if you decide to leave at like 11.30. But in general, it's a good time to kind of go. And obviously Sundays as well, it's not going to be the baitest time for people to go and party, so you'll probably avoid all the lager outs and the weirdos i don't know maybe two who knows maybe there are, might be some lager outs and weirdos left around left who might go but for the most part it seems like a, they usually attract a good crowd and it's kind of friends and family and some unannounced special guests so i can only imagine the amount of good people who might end up passing through the people who played that new year's eve and maybe are leaving on a monday and they want to play quickly get your set in throughout the afternoon or early evening and then head back to your hotel and you know jump on the first flight back out there on a monday so this is a listing courtesy of instagram courtesy of folds instagram it says unfold new year's day 24 24 what a year 23 sundays we have spent together we danced we cried we learned we loved but most importantly we grew we grew into a community that openly manifests queer centered dance floors where all can be free to explore their sexuality and gender and be celebrated whilst doing so now our 24th dance will be for 20 will last for 24 hours as always the lineup is unannounced and tickets are only available on the door 20 for 20 pounds which is an absolute bargain if you think about it because most new year's days or new year's eve events are going to be through the roof in terms of what they're going to be pricing it as i know most places i'm, I'm going to assume fair to say are going to price anywhere between like 30 pounds to 70 maybe to 100 pounds depending on where you're at and in some places 
I know from, you know, being friends with a lot of flipping security guards, having gone out for so many years, you sometimes get familiar with a lot of these people and they maybe, you know, are cool enough to kind of, you know, give you the odd chat here and there on the queue. And they'd always say like, you know, New Year's Day and New Year's Eve would be a great time to make some extra money on the side because people are so desperate to come in. They might want to give you a little tip to get them bounce up in front of the queue, which sometimes some scumbaggy bouncers will take your money and still not let you in, which is cruel. But for the most part, you can make a lot of extra change if you are working on the door, especially, you know, outside of people giving your tips just the time you're working was absolutely crazy so that's obviously can be great but like i said before 20 quid for a new year's day party in a venue that you know most likely is going to be is, is probably one of our best in london they're going to have a pretty decent lineup even if it's just only friends and family and it's going to be a vibe like that's that's a pretty good deal entrance is not guaranteed which i like and it's at the discretion of our fold entrance team unfolds entrance team so this is going to be door picking which is going to be essential because it's new year's day um, you know, quite slash New Year's Eve or before that New Year's Eve, it's going to be essential that they have absolute, the right person on the door. I can imagine a whole group of man, there's people rolling through because they remembered, oh yeah, this place fold is open. And because there's going to be so many people out in London just in Ubers trying to find the next motive. That's usually the plan. I know I've done it before in my past where I've kind of been in an Uber, jumping around from place to place, trying to make sure my Wi Fi is connected. You know, I've got a 3G so I can find the next rave to kind of bounce to. But if they'd store select and whatnot, it should be a pretty decent vibe. So I'm actually, I'm thinking of going if I'm able to kind of wake up in time. As always, the lineup is unannounced. Please ensure you bring physical ID and as always, dress to sweat. So this legitimately could be one of the ones I end up going to, but I'm still on the fence as to what I may do. Most likely on New Year's Eve, I'll probably end up going somewhere for dinner and having some drinks or whatnot and welcoming the New Year that way. But if I do end up going out on New Year's Day, it's probably going to be to unfold. So if you are looking for a place to go out in London, I probably would recommend that. If you're looking, if you are looking, if you're not, then obviously don't care, don't care, don't care. Anyway, moving on. We got this video courtesy of Tom Segura, the well-known comedian who's also part of Your Mum's House and has various other podcasts that he does. Also, you know, uh, Two Bears, One Cave and I think another interview show. He went viral the last week or so because of this video that he put out where he essentially chastises his audience for complaining about the fact that him and his co-host, Burke Kreischer, on their podcast Two Bears, One Cave, quite often talk about a lot of like rich guy shit right a lot of like middle age not even middle age sorry a lot of like 50 year old plus rich guy shit where you know you've you been grinding for a while and then you suddenly become wealthy in your like late 40s or maybe late 30s early 40s and you're now starting to enjoy the things that you could never enjoy prior like first class fights no first class flights sorry not fights private jets um swanky trainers because you know la types they love you know la dads love to wear like norm core clothes and like funky like you know trainers like sbs and whatnot or jordans to appear cool and hip you know trendy beard cuts and whatnot and eat at lavish places and i guess the fan base have just had enough of it and they don't really like it so some of them have been complaining to like keep the rich guy shit to yourselves but tom Segura clearly doesn't feel the same and he felt he needed to send out a bit of a PSA to his fans. This is Tom Segura's clip where he took and he's basically talking about that. I'm going to play it now so you can hear it and then I'll give you my comments on the other side. Every time we talk about like a watch or a car, I'll get us a, like a, a bunch of messages from losers that try to tell me that mm -hmm. I'm, I'm making them feel bad about their situation you're in control of your own situation and your own feelings. So don't put it on me that you feel bad that I have something that, oh, but I, I'm struggling with rent this month. Figure it the fuck out, okay? Like, don't make <laughs> my life be a problem for your life. If you don't like it, guess what? You're not going to be able to control what people talk about. People are going to talk about things that you don't have for the rest of your fucking life. Here's the thing. If you're, if you're still mad about this, just know... That it's your mindset and you're thinking like a fucking loser, but you don't have to. You don't. You can change the way you think, but you have to accept the way you're thinking right now is not going to get you anywhere. You're being bitter. You're being petty. You're insecure. You're not confident. <laughs> if you just sit around and you, mm, you know what? You only have what you have because of fans. So don't talk about us like that. Yeah, but you're still a loser if you're thinking like that. You're maybe uh I'm lucky to have you as a loser fan, but you don't have to be that way. You, can you could be a winner as at the end. I thought that's absolutely hilarious because 
I think, I don't know. <laughs> My impression is a twofold. I think when I was younger, I had far more maybe envy or I'd feel far more FOMO because I legitimately couldn't do the things I was seeing people that I looked up to were doing or people maybe I looked up to people that were doing the things that I wanted to do like in terms of an occupation or in terms of a you know career or in terms of a you know um, business they launched like that was something that I had an idea of doing so when I saw people that were you know very young creative directors maybe who had published works on magazines or platforms that I wanted to be a part of, who maybe had, you know, work exhibited at particular galleries or particular competitions or people that had two particular brands that were very fluid, able to kind of move between different, you know, sectors and areas and whatnot. That would obviously give me a bit of FOMO because I just couldn't work out how they did it. But then as soon as you get a little bit older and you gain a bit more experience and you start to maybe figure life out a bit, you just start to realize that a lot of that stuff is quite in reach. It's not that difficult to do. It looks really wild, but if you actually want to do it, it's not that hard. Obviously, there's no guarantees that you will also become the creative director of a flipping Louis Vuitton or something. You know, that's obviously not on the cast for everybody. But if you want to launch your own little studio, your own little creative studio where you have a small, you know, uh, a small selection of brands that you work with um, on particular projects throughout the year and whatnot and present this image that you're this guy that wakes up at you know 6 a.m and goes for a run and jumps in his g-wagon and heads to the office with your nice flipping furniture and your nice you know office and whatnot and you call people that work alongside it's not that difficult of a dream to kind of put into motion it sounds really far-fetched when you're, you know, like me at that time when you're working retail somewhere and you're actually fighting to get hours. Imagine, imagine working at a retail job that you legitimately hate and you don't want to be there. Yeah, you know, because we all get, I think, especially when you're in the creative world, you kind of get roped into the idea that you have to kind of work on the shop floor in order to get to the office, which is a real misnomer. You don't. You could legitimately just do your own thing and work like a, well, you can work in a flipping supermarket and do your own thing on the side as like, you know, launch a magazine or set up a brand and just pitch yourself to the actual brands or the companies that you want to work for and, and get in straight away to head office without having to do the whole like dream from shop floor thing. But usually when you are working on shop floor, like I was and you sold that dream or you, you know, you kind of was naive enough to believe it, you will kind of start to think, how can I get to a place where that create like how imagine for instance when i was growing up my people that i looked up to were the james jebbias the chris you know the chris gibbs the hiroshi fujiwaras the negos those are my kind of what brenda would say north stars those are the people that i looked at i wasn't looking at the people in between i didn't really give a fuck i knew that in order to kind of shift culture leave my mark on the flipping cultural timeline i need to be on that kind of level I'd be looking at myself thinking, I'm in this retail store. How am I ever going to become my version or whatever I want to be in terms of, you know, my version of a Hiroshi Fujiwara is so far away. But you don't realize until you get older that actually it isn't. All you need to do is just start, you know, making projects, making little products and stuff. And maybe, you know, maybe not selling them, maybe just showcasing them on your Instagram and whatnot. And just, you know, displaying that you have an ability to do A and B, that you maybe have an ability to communicate certain ideas. You maybe have an ability to kind of present, you know, works in different ways, prototypes, different things, puff into productions, explore different ways of doing this and that and whatnot. And then suddenly now, you are basically in the same sort of realm. You know, it doesn't really take that much. Just a Shopify account, you know, monthly, uh, uh, you know, flipping subscription to your Photoshop, which is amazing. When I was growing up, I had to get a flipping, uh, what's that thing called? I had to get one that was pirated and whatnot, but now you can essentially, everyone can afford a fully stocked version of Photoshop and Illustrator by paying anywhere between like $8 and flipping $20 a month, which is peanuts, considering what everyone's paying on their flipping streaming services and whatnot. And you could easily get that done. So that whole kind of like envy or feeling jealousy of people in terms of what they have in terms of jobs and careers, I think is mostly when you're younger, don't know how to get to that point with yourself. I think when it comes to Tom Segura and these comedy podcasts, to be fair to the fans, it's not that they're complaining that you're always talking about rich guy shit. It's that for the most part, I think most fans of most podcasts doesn't have to be even comedy ones like you know stand up comics. It can be any podcast. I think we've all kind of seen I've seen it myself with stuff like the Joe Budden podcast and that original lineup with Rory and Moore, that eventually when the money starts to get a little bit higher or, you know, the clout is getting, you know, more and more, whatever it may be, the relationships crumble and you see people change. Now, it's not only because of money, but you know the dynamics of a relationship were 
much different when Joe Biden was recording that podcast, you know, from I think it's Parks's first or well, Parks's home. I think that was the original location. And then it slowly started to change once they started to get a bit more money. They upgraded the studio or Parks moved into a new place. The, you know, the, the camera started to get a bit more shiny. The mics got a little bit better. Everything started to become a little bit better. But then the quality of the pod kind of dropped. And obviously Joe Biden's star or head got a little bit bigger and it got worse. And it stopped getting funny after a while. It became a really serious type of pod. And maybe there's a lot of baggage behind the scenes that they were kind of, you know, dragging on the show themselves. But with comedy podcasts, for sure, you see it all the time. As soon as these guys start to become more successful and the deals start to come in, they lose the focus and they forget all the funny stuff and only start to comment or rant about the rich guy shit. And it might just be a, a kind of, um, it might just be a consequence of just not having much to talk about. Because it's quite difficult, I'd imagine, if you're one of those big LA comics and you have like three or four shows that you do and you bank shows, there's only so much cultural commentary you can do. After a while, you're going to start having to mine your own sort of life and your own life may be interesting or it may be really funny to you how much you were quoted for a private jet but for the regular person listening to it on their headphones at work whilst they're typing in you know some flipping pivot tables or whatnot into excel it just comes across a little bit boring a little bit kind of you know whatever dead and the opposite of funny so i can understand fans in that respect and i think for the most part it is one of those unfortunate parts of being a avid fan of a pod you're going to reach a stage where you're going to have to decide am i okay with listening to these guys now that they've changed or should i just dump it and go to somewhere else because there's no way you can complain and make them see the way or make them see the error of their ways i've very rarely seen a podcast or like kind of you know notice that they've kind of shifted how they are as a person and people don't like it or the fans don't like it and and kind of adjust you don't really see that they usually double or triple down and whoever wants to stay stays whoever goes goes for me personally i stopped listening to two bears one cave a long time ago mostly because of burr he's kind of annoying i know he's kind of got he's got a good heart on him but the way that he kind of centers everything about himself it's just nauseating you never seen somebody like you know really really enjoy the sound of their own voice and kind of ask people questions and finish the answer themselves and it's just a bit too much to kind of deal with um and i kind of you know even your mom's house the main podcast i stopped listening to that mainly because it just stopped being funny it just turned into like you know you know christina p obviously being married to tom segura you know just talking about rich people shit it's just boring after a while it's not that anyone's jealous it's just boring because most people can't relate to it number one and also i don't know you're just complaining about the things you can't buy or the things that you have now because of your money that aren't that great like it's like, i don't know it's a little, it comes across a little bit um page pa 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 patronizing maybe it's patronizing is the right word i'm not too sure what the word is but either way i definitely understand where the fans are coming from but i also understand from tom's point of view it's like hey if i have the means to do these things and i want to talk about them i can't talk about them but the fans are also free to say fuck you we're going to move somewhere else so there should be an acceptance of that but again these content creators these podcasters these stand-ups they really have a hard time digesting that some people are fans and are also allowed to be critical that's the interesting side i think about a lot of these people they sometimes have they want to have like a one-way relationship with fans and just give them the content and then they just absorb it. They don't want any kind of feedback, especially if it's critical, especially if it's somewhat, you know, nuanced. No, it just has to be overall play, praise. It has to be, you know, those corny guys that Joe Rogan shares on his Instagram where they get tattoos of his face on their body and stuff. He wants all of that stuff. But when it comes to somebody giving you a sort of, you know, rational, somewhat push back on something that you said in a previous pod or a point you failed to raise or whatever it may be, they suddenly get really defensive and start doubling down, they start freaking out. So it must just be a flipping process that everyone kind of goes through. So maybe I shouldn't talk about it too much because maybe when I start making, um, you know, millions of dollars, I might end up changing and being that guy. I really doubt it, but you never know. Also need to really talk about, obviously, obviously mention the GOAT that is Lionel Messi in that performance in the flipping World Cup against France. Argentina obviously won the World Cup. I think most of you are aware of that. And it was legitimately one of the best finals I've ever watched in my you know recent history. Um, definitely, I'm sure there were many other World Cups in the 60s, 70s and 80s that were far better than other fans who are older than me can kind of remember. But in this modern era, this was may maybe one of the best ones. With two very well-balanced teams, even though Argentina took a really early two-goal lead until basically the 70th minute when France did wake up. They were two very evenly matched teams going head-to-head. -head, two of their star players turning it on when it really mattered. Messi, obviously, with France and then Mbappe with France. Oh, no. 
of Messi, sorry, with Argentina and Mbappe with France. And it was legitimately one of the best spectacles I've seen of the game. It was honestly amazing to watch. And I think as a story, I think it was beneficial or a somewhat a romantic way to end the World Cup or end maybe Messi's overall international journey with Argentina for him to be able to lift the World Cup and put to bed any maybe debate when it comes to who's better from Cristiano Ronaldo and you know Lionel Messi for me I've always favoured Cristiano or Ronaldo because I think the reason why a lot of people focus on my reasoning why I think a lot of people like Cristiano Ronaldo vis-a-vis -vis Messi obviously he has a bit more personality to him and also I feel like Cristiano, Cristiano Ronaldo is more relatable in that he came to United a really flashy, skinny, scrawny kind of, you know, um, you know, unproductive winger when he came to United. And then under the, you know, coaching of McLaren and maybe, you know, was it McLaren? Maybe McLaren, somebody else, um, you know, mostly Sarex Ferguson, that sort of mentorship and whatnot. And obviously guided with all the kind of ex-pros that are around him, like Rio Ferdinand and, you know, Roy Keane and whatnot, these great leaders. He was able, and Paul Scholes and whatnot, he was able to adapt his game and change his game and evolve his game into being this absolutely devastating, you know, winger forward hybrid thing that he was at United. And I always maintain, even to this day, despite him having maybe a better goal record at Real Madrid, he was a, my favorite version of Ronaldo was definitely at Man United. But I feel like a lot of fans see themselves in Ronaldo because he came as this flashy guy, really unproductive, and then he was evolved into this really amazing player after a while. So he wasn't as naturally gifted as a Messi. Where you see videos of Messi when he's like, you know, 10 years old and stuff, running rings around players, you know, two years or four years older than him, which is absolutely a scene. But it's easy to tell someone like a Messi at that 12 years old stage where he's obviously going to become one of the world's greats if he continues on that trajectory. But for Ronaldo, I'm pretty sure he he's like many of us who play football, where he may have had potential, but, you know, who, you know, it's not a lot of times that that potential of an average or like of a standard player will kind of go on to become one of the world's best. And he obviously did that. But for the Messi story and for just the people who kind of doubted his talent, especially now in his older years, I feel like we've definitely seen a, a difference in the ability and the the ability to influence games. We've seen a real difference the older they've become because Ronaldo kind of relied a lot on his pace and his power, obviously, and some of his skill also. But once that pace and power left him, he became a little bit shaky, right? He didn't really look as effective on the pitch. But Messi has never always been about pace. There's always been a lot of brains involved in what he does. Obviously, the pace and his ability to dribble at speed in tight spaces and control and whatnot goes a long way. But still, fundamentally, the guy is an amazing footballer. Like, he can play as a number 10, can play as a number 8. You can see him dropping even further back and just playing this weird quarterback role and kind of using that as a way to kind of build from the defence but that has essentially allowed him to maybe prolong his career in terms of impact further. So maybe he might not end up playing for as long as Ronaldo. Maybe Ronaldo's still got a couple more years and then he might end up playing until he's like 40 or 45, who knows. But I feel like Messi will have, still have a lot more impact on the bigger stages. And this is what we saw him doing for Argentina because he turned it on when they needed him the most and was able to deliver one of the standout performances that I've definitely seen in the World Cup. So I'm really happy for Messi, for sure. Obviously, you know, um, honourable mention goes to Mbappe also. I think he definitely proved in that World Cup that he definitely is that guy. I feel like a lot of people like myself who maybe thought Harry Kane could be on that kind of level saw the differences when it comes to when your country or when your team actually needs you in the clutch crunch moments when all the pressure's on your shoulder, when you know this is the only opportunity you have to really turn this game around and to really change the overall flow of the game. Mbappe did it. You know, um, France got a really um, fortunate penalty and then they were able to kind of claw that one goal back and that momentum and that kind of energy was what allowed them to get the second goal, which I think came within a minute or so after the penalty. And that second goal from Mbappe was out of this world. The one-two with Marcus Toram and then the volley inside the box, one-touch finish. Like he could have actually taken, I think someone said it in the commentary, he could have actually taken a touch in the box and kind of took the ball a bit closer to the goal, especially considering how fast he is. And he still would have had a good opportunity to score, but he took it at the earliest point. And that finish kind of volley side foot thing, very Terry Henry-esque was exquisite to watch. So that was an incredible performance. And then of course, 
finishing the the hat trick um goal with obviously the third goal at the end. Um also Kula Munya Munai Kula Kolo Munyai. Is that how you pronounce his name? Or Kolo Munai or how you pronounce his name? I think it's Congolese origin for France. He made a real difference too when he came on. Mark Sermon and him did a real difference. You can see he really had a bit between his teeth. He really wanted to put on a good, strong World Cup final performance. And for sure, that's definitely elevated his um, kind of appeal and definitely increased his price tag if he ends up leaving. I think he plays for Frankfurt. But overall, a stellar game. I enjoyed every bit of it and absolutely loved it. And I can't actually wait for the America World Cup. That's going to be the next one, right? I think it's 2026. And that's going to think all over the United States. It's going to be pretty interesting to see how they um, work that out and how they get that sorted in terms of logistics and letting people kind of travel between stadiums and whatnot but that should be a pretty decent affair also um i feel like the discourse around some guys out there i think there's been a lot of people i think specifically like you know the gay side of social media and girls and stuff especially on my side of stuff when it comes to high fashion twitter when it comes to gay twitter or queer twitter and stuff who have been really upset about the world cup because it's been you know their timelines have been flooded with guys just spazzing out about World Cup stuff and a lot of them were elated, elated, so over elated that the World Cup is finally over. But I find some of the straight dudes who go out of their way to, you know, say they're not into sports, I find that really odd. I don't actually get that. Like how does that happen? Because for me, I'm not sure if you're if you're the same, but if you are heterosexual, for the most part, the only way you make friends is really through sports or through maybe music, or through maybe video games. When I was growing up, those are usually the three main things that you make you know, friends with. And usually, you don't essentially like those things, but you might you just do them because you want to hang out with your friends. But I feel like a lot of the people that are saying the, you know, the, the kind of hot takes of like, oh, I'm glad the World Cup's over because it's corny, because it's lame, because football's boring. It's like, it's legitimately one of the greatest sports in the world, in my opinion. I don't think you're going to get a better spectacle than that game against Argentina and France in the World Cup final in Qatar. Like, that was a legitimate, legitimate blockbuster TV. Like, two goals ahead, Argentina, um, and France score a penalty on the 70th minute like they were legitimately you know in some sort of malaise there was you know those rumors that they were you know infected with some sort of poison that the whole camp were caught some virus or some cold that they didn't want to speak about they legitimately woke up in the 70th minute got a fortunate penalty were able to claw back a goal and then that gave them momentum to get a second brilliant goal and then Messi scores a third I think maybe an extra time to make it you know 3-2 and you're suddenly thinking okay aren't you going to win then France pull one back again with another penalty then we just think oh my god this is kind of continue going on and then you have one of the best punish shoot actually you've ever seen also it was a brilliant Amy Martin's performance of between the sticks brilliant so I can't understand if you're a straight dude how you can legitimately say entertainment wise again you don't need to like football but entertainment wise not liking it is weird like I don't know what those guys are doing I really would like to know actually if you're watching this or if you're listening to this and you are a dude who never really cared for football what were you doing beforehand like what how did you make friends then because I can't think of anything else outside of video games, sports as a general thing. And what I, I think I've got the other thing I said. But I can't think of any other things outside of that that would legitimately allow you to hang around with guys and make friends and whatnot and whatever it may be. It doesn't necessarily work that way. Maybe when you're older, it kind of changes and you start to meet people in pubs and bars or galleries or other, you know, hobbies and interests that you may have and different, you know, scenarios like you might have, you know, good close group of friends at work that you hang out with all the time. And that might be just because you share a commonality that you work in the same place or whatnot, or you're into the same brands, or like, you know, you know, high fashion Twitter, or that sort of community stuff might be there. But when you're growing up from the ages of like, five to 13 or 15, how else do you make friends if you're a straight lad, like, without sports and video games? So like, how could you not like it? Or maybe some people, they started off liking it, and then when they get older, they're like, oh, I'm, I'm out of love with it. But I feel like a lot of these hot tech McGee's when it comes to, oh, I'm glad the football's over, I'm glad World Cup's over. Most of them are just like either trying to appease the hoes, right, or they're trying to appease the gays, which is a new thing now because gays are really cool. You want to be, you want to be down with the queer community, so they're either trying to get, they're either trying to gay bait, they're trying to, you know, kind of get get the hoes on side. Or they're just trying to be different for different sake. But I can't understand how any other straight lad could legitimately hate football or hate sports in general. Like, what else were you doing to find other male friends? Like, legit. 
or were you one of those weirdos that had loads of girlfriends when you were like in secondary school which is always bizarre in my opinion it's like why would you want to hang out with girls at that age you legitimately thought they were like you know covered in lurgies and whatnot right um and you just were covered in snot yourself and you just wanted to kick balls at each other and maybe give each other flipping wedges and whatnot or slap each other's balls which is you know not very homoerotic but kind of homoerotic but you know what i mean but yeah i find all that it's kind of hot text really odd and really bizarre to handle but hey what can you do what can you do and i also wanted to talk about this which i feel like is maybe a, a different sort of point to talk about when it comes to the whole like you know megan the stallion kylie jenner thing or no, megan the stallion and Tori Lanez, not kylie jenner but i'm gonna come to kylie jenner you know the story and the trial around it is boring you know whatever get to the flipping verdict i'm tired of that whole shit bang but just thinking about it overall and remembering the crib because i remember when i saw um, pictures i think this article courtesy of daily mail um from 2020 says a home fit for billionaire college in the pays 36.5 million for a lavish resort compound in the holby holmby hills as she adds to her impressive property empire this woman's got an empire and she's what 25 26 or something or no how she must be now maybe 25 if that was 2022 absolutely incredible so i remember seeing this when it first was sort of like you know leaked to the media that she bought this amazing home and the one thing that i really loved about it was this weird little kind of open um plan patio type of vibe thing going on you don't really see it if you don't listen to the pod but essentially it feels like there's like one big version one big side of the house that's like a main house then towards the back of it there's like this rectangle um swimming pool that also has a kind of guest roomy bar thing behind it also or kind of in front of it but it's all kind of open type plans so they've got these really massive kind of floor to ceiling window type things that you can kind of look out on so you can effectively have different people sleeping on these different sort of pods room things there on the side here with the curtains but it's you also got the ability to have a pool but it's also kind of separate from the main home and i remember again not being a, the, the biggest fan of this kind of architecture or interior design style i feel like it's very la very shiny loads of chromes loads of granites loads of grays loads of golds and silvers and slates and whatnot that kind of weird kind of la show home type of thing that doesn't really have any warmth any kind of um familiarity love um you know story and narrative around it It just feels like nice things that would look good in a magazine or a catalog put together in a show house but with no real kind of love and warmth to it whatsoever you kind of think of you know Ken, Ken Kanye's house with Kim that was kind of you know made to look very sparse and not many belongings anywhere and basically looks like an art gallery and this is kind of the same sort of vibe maybe a bit McMansion-y style but still I remember seeing this first when it kind of got leaked that she bought this crib and thinking this house looks really nice I just love this bit this bit is probably my favorite this kind of you know that kind of um rectangle swimming pool thing with the it feels like canapé villary type villa type pods on the side and it kind of just felt like the best place that you could invite guests or friends over right you got this amazing like open plan sort of vibe you got these beds on the side of the pool that you can lay down on not nice lights underneath the pool i think most of you would be familiar with the video if you remember the video of megan and kylie and tori in the pool you remember this sort of scene with the blue leds and the light shining and whatnot looking amazing so the one thing i can't understand for me this whole story is that imagine being invited to kylie jenner's crib and from what we've been told or what we heard from the court cases the flipping bottles were running free they had like what's that don julio right on tap it was legitimately on tap or obviously on tap but they had bottle after bottle after bottle i'm assuming you know families like that they probably especially when you consider how much tequila they'll drink and you know they kind of promoted that brand really well i'd assume they probably get some of it free but a lot of it just they pay for it because they're just fans of the alcohol and I'd imagine also if you're somebody who commits to being a beautiful social media influencer where you essentially have to you know you sell your you know your attractiveness and your, your ability to be hot is your currency so you have to maybe abstain from a lot i know it doesn't require a lot of talent to be the connections but you still have to commit yourself to like you know fasting more most of the time you know you know cutting out all the other snacks getting lots of cosmetic surgery all these things are not easy to do but your only vice maybe you could kind of you know dip your toes into might be some tequila and maybe some other class a substances right but for the most part they booze a lot i feel like because it's the one thing they can do 
after they've kind of been strict with, you know, making sure they avoided the junk food and all that sort of malarkey. So you get invited to this crib and it's just booze on booze on tap and bottle after bottle of bottle is coming. And you get involved in some sort of spat if you believe the rumours to be true, especially after the recent day, I think now, with EJ, I think who was the former stylist of Megan, which is interesting, right, in this court case. There's a lot of former on Megan's side of things. I wonder if they're going to do that with Tori. They're going to bring some of these former friends because I feel like off the back of this whole affair, she fell out with a lot of her friends that were there. You know, Kelsey being the best friend, EJ being the stylist. They all kind of fell out of each other. So that might say for her, you know, ability to keep friends or not, who knows, who doesn't care. But the main thing is that I think he was saying at the event that there was loads of bottles on deck and they were just there to have a good time. It was more of a gathering and less of a party. I guess they don't like to have the turn party because they don't like vagabonds turning up and trying to vibe also. But, you know, there was mention of security guards being in the tuck, which is crazy because you never see them anytime you see an Instagram clip of Kylie Jenner's go viral or Kylie Kendall Jenner. You never ever see the security, but they're always there, you know, um, in the corner somewhere on their iPhone playing, flipping, I don't know, some games or, or watching something on ESPN. But when, if shit pops down, they're ready to pull out the blicky and get flipping active. But I just can't imagine being in a crib like this. And the first thing I want to do is start to get spicy and, you know, get a bit aggregate, get, get a bit um, agitated and let the liquor take over me and be in a mood and whatnot. That wouldn't be the first thing I'd be in. If anything, at these type of events, I've said it before that I kind of pride myself on being like the best house party guest. I feel like I am. I feel like I don't overstay my welcome. I feel like if you invite me, I'm going to bring drinks and some other stuff. I'm always going to be willing to share. I'm always going to, you know, have the funnies, have the jokes on deck and just be a kind of a good person to kind of have a house party the kind of crucial person you need that's not going to be all up in people's faces trying to hook up with people just trying to just enjoy the vibe of everything and i think i do that pretty well but there are some people who don't necessarily care and just kind of the same way they'd act in the club they'd go and act at somebody's house and i can't again maybe your home girl's house fair enough but kylie jenner's house come on bro like that would just be like for me especially not being a fan of, of the family that much and just you know not caring for them as people, but also being intrigued. I just want to just observe them from afar and just see how they interact, how they talk, what they talk about, you know, whatever it may be. That just that would be the most, or how they interact with others, especially their staff members and whatnot, um, their homes, what they might have, little trinkets. Those things will kind of fascinate me more. Like maybe they might have some flipping crazy piece of artwork on the wall somewhere that I'll be like, oh my God, you've got an original Cezanne in your flipping living room. <laughs> like that might be cool to check out. But me get absolutely sloshed on the booze is not something i do maybe after the third or fifth visit that you've been there if they welcome you back again you might be like, okay cool now it's time to relax and get lit but for the most part i just want to be a good company right like be able to pour some drinks maybe be able to rustle up some food or something right just be a good helping hand know what good playlist to put on put some people onto some new artists that they might like and whatnot that'd be a sick way to go about it but i could never imagine the first thing i'd want to do is get so lit that i end up you know getting into some sort of altercation at least to me being shot in the foot that's the last thing i'm thinking of doing but just looking at some of these clips or some of these pictures taken from the daily mail of the inside of kajin's mansion and it looks absolutely beautiful to be fair that bit like i said that bit on the outside is definitely my favorite where it's got a swimming pool that kind of looks open planish type of vibe and you know the ability to basically separate people and you can basically stay in this side of the home and let people do their thing over there is absolutely incredible i like that if anything i'd have it both ways i maybe have them you know i'd maybe have the house i think basically if you think about it like a like an equal sign so in the equal sign you've got the two bars and then those two bars will be the blocks the kind of houses so that would be east wing and and west wing and in the middle you have a swimming pool so you could basically separate you know the house in that kind of way that'd be pretty sick and each kind of place could have its own entrance to go into also but i just like i said i just cannot imagine walking into such an expensive shiny place and the first thing i want to do is get lit to the point where i'm involved in the shooting it just wouldn't happen because this would be marvelous enough to look at like i already get you know wide-eyed when i go to like a you know a private members club like a soho house or whatnot or like what's the other one ned here in london that we have right and so a few others you're just kind of observing the flipping architecture and the interior design and the upholstery you're looking at some of the program notes and whatnot looking at the pictures of some of the celebrity people that walk through that's the first thing you're kind of fascinated about but you're not you know there to get 
like super white girl wasted. I would imagine you're not. Anyway, that's my impression. But you know, certain people go about things differently. But if anything, this whole case should be a reminder for people to try to be the best guest you can be at these events, especially at house parties, because you know, because it's a somewhat comfortable arena, you can get a little bit relaxed. You can feel a little bit like you can, you know, not be as pent up or maybe as shy as you would be in the club and be a little bit more loose but if ever if anything you should probably be more on point at a house party than you should be in the club really if you think about it you should be paying more attention because usually i feel like the bad ledges of people usually stem from things they've done at house parties not clubs you know someone has like a bad impression of you it's maybe something that you've done at a house party maybe you open the door you know when to open you're being too handsy with the fridge or with people you are asking weird questions and just being ratty and annoying and com you know combative and confrontational i feel like all that stuff usually happens at house parties i feel like in clubs you can get away with kind of a lot more because people can't see you you can maybe find a corner to mong out in but in house parties you know think of those kind of houses that they've got right the kardashians with all these lights all over the place right it's very very well lit um, i'd hate to know what the electricity bill at these places are but you can't really get away with much when all the lights are there the cctv everywhere security cards everywhere and there's probably at least three or four people there that are rock solid sober you're gonna see everything that you do and then you kind of you know you know little slight that you say out there but you know whatever happens with the case happens with the case but i feel like being a good guest is probably the lesson to take away from that thing because you know who wants to end up in a flipping shooting that's absolutely crazy continuing on from that we're going to touch upon this this is a story courtesy of the bbc regarding the unfortunate events that um preceded a asake or i think it's pronounced ashake if i'm not if i'm not mistaken who's a very very popular um afro beast artist at the moment who's absolutely smashing it and doing absolutely amazing things his recent album that came out or ep however you want to call it was really really impressive i've been playing it a lot on my phone at the moment let me actually pull up what the name of it is because i forgot but um He's been someone that I've definitely been a fan of over the last few months, having only recently discovered him. I'm not going to say I was a big fan prior, but his album is called Mr. Money with the Vibe. And it legitimately is maybe one of the best Afrobeat type albums I've heard in a very long time. You think of somebody like, a, you know, um, what's his face, a Burner Boy or a Whiz Kid, you know, being some of the top, top people out there. And for sure, Ashake is definitely up there in terms of his appeal and his ability to make music that just touches your soul. Because I feel like for me, Maybe I'm one of those people, I'm a bit of a casual Afrobeats listener, and I feel like a lot of the stuff ends up sounding the same. There was a period in Afrobeats where everyone was kind of coming out with the same type of vibe, and it was a bit boring, obviously, until I found people like Remmer and stuff who were really doing cool, interesting things with their voice, and the tonality and instrumentation and whatnot, that was obviously elevating the sound, but overall, everyone was basically sounding like poor imitations of, you know, Davido, to, you know, Burner Boy, Wizkid, and whatnot. But I feel like Ashake is definitely someone that's kind of brought something fresh and new. So it's no surprise that there's been such a big demand for his events, especially when you consider um, some of the viral videos that have been going around in terms of people going to parties and having a great time and all these dancers coming out and doing great. But unfortunately, the event that happened in Brixton Academy here in London was an absolute tragedy because I'm assuming people saw some of the earlier dates that happened um in the uk i think there was an event in birmingham that obviously has a bit of trouble also but i think there's maybe a couple more dates in london that people were really excited about and the videos went viral and people basically were you know pumped to go but then the event was sold out way 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 in advance and there was an abundance of people who turned up to brixton academy with no ticket or who turned up with tickets that were fake i don't know which way it goes so there's a lot of people that came there basically um just to try and see if they could finagle their way in but I guess everybody had the same idea. So when you add all the people that are turning up there for a sold out event and people that didn't turn up there with tickets, that's a lot of people. And it decided to cause a bit of a ruckus outside to the point where people were pushing and, you know, and trying to basically storm the door, which they ended up doing. But then as soon as they stormed the door, the event was locked up because the event was over capacity and they become a fire hazard and obviously a health risk. But during that whole rush to go in front of the door and try to get in, unfortunately a couple of people were very very badly injured i think at the time which is crazy to think at the time at the time the official rumors that came out at the time uh, when it was happening because i was kind of following it in real time on twitter and whatnot was that two people passed away 
I remember tweeting something like, oh my God, I hope that isn't true. But one random girl somewhere was saying, yeah, I saw someone on Snapchat that said two people definitely passed away. And I was at on the scene, which is weird because these two ladies who ended up passing away, ended up passing away a couple of days later. So I'm not too sure if people that were there saw these women in really bad shape and thought, hey, this is no way they're going to survive this. Or I don't know, but it's just interesting how that has kind of transpired to be the case. These two ladies have obviously succumbed to injuries. But if I'm not mistaken, it was three people that were severely injured from the event. So similar to what happened at kind of like um, Astro World with Travis Scott and two of them unfortunately succumbed to their injuries. The first one being a mother of two, um, absolutely tragic, especially when you consider this lady, Rebecca Iku Mello, um, 33 from Newham, the same borough that I grew up in in East London, um, died. So, you know, I'm sure she's somebody who I probably share a lot of mutual friends with. I don't really know her personally myself, but I'm sure if I looked close enough, I could find a lot of people that know her that also know me. So that definitely is a bit too close to home. But the uh, article reads as follows. A woman has died after being injured in a crush at a gig in London's Brixton Auto Academy that left several others hurt. The concert by Afro pop singer Ashake um, had to be abandoned part way through after a large number of people tried to force their way inside on Thursday the Met Police said from what I read on Instagram or from what I read on Twitter in real time people were saying allegedly people are saying allegedly that there was up to 3,000 people that didn't have tickets that turned up that sounds a bit insane to me personally because I didn't see 3,000 people on the flipping videos outside but even just a thousand is too many people if you don't have a ticket stay your ass at home trying to bum rush the you know the stage or the flipping door to try and get in is only going to lead to flipping you know misery and pain and i saw a lot of violent exchanges with police i saw one video of some police officer pushing some girl off the stairs of Bristol. if you've been to Bristol academy you'll know it's got a couple of stairs that you kind of walk up on not the highest don't get me wrong but still pushing a girl full pelt and luckily i think some guys were able to hold her or kind of cushion her force so she didn't absolutely bang her head on the concrete which would have been really crazy but there's a lot of kind of that kind of violence I saw some other video of some guy look like he was homeless i'm um, slapping a police officer in the face or maybe trying to slap his hat off his face i think which was wild to see um, some crazy exchanges but yeah that's allegedly there was up to maybe 1,000 to 3,000 people that didn't have tickets so you can only imagine mother of two Rebecca Ukumela 33 of Newham East London died in hospital on Saturday morning the Met said her family said she was a nursing graduate known for her care and kindness two other women aged 21 and 23 remained in critical condition and police added as Shake said that he was overwhelmed with grief and devastated by her death the artist said he had spoken to Mr. Kula's family and asked people to keep them in our prayers in a statement released through the Met her family said Miss Ukum- Ukumelo was an adorable mother of two children who loved working with kids absolutely tragic and i think the kids are legitimately must be under 10 and what makes it tragic also i'm pretty sure one of the kids has like learning disabilities or something you know which you can only imagine a kid like that growing up like you know like how you kind of trying to process that kind of information of your kind of your 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 mum passing must be wild uh but yeah just a mum went out to have some fun on a weekday maybe some rare time where you get to you know spend some time on your own and party and have a have some fun you you, you know it's the one time you could basically afford to maybe have a babysitter or the one time you maybe wanted to be you know away from your kids a one night just to kind of have some fun again just to chill whatever and you go and then it turns into an absolute horror show man oh my thoughts of fiends go out to her and her family absolutely horrible um, they said she was well respected by uh, for in the family for her care kindness and love her parents call her tossin short for all over tossin meaning lord is worthy a cabin music group um which owns and runs a venue said in a statement all of o2 Brixton academy and academy music group deeply saddened about the news of tragic death of rebecca ukumelo we send our heartfelt condolences to rebecca's family and friends and our thoughts with everyone affected by this devastating news and to make matters even worse a second lady a second lady um passed named by gabby hutchinson um as you can see that's there on the picture there and i think she's even younger a second person has died gabby hutchinson aged 23 down hospital in the early hours of monday 9th of december he was working what is that he okay maybe pronouns wise um he was working as one of the contracted security providers for the event at the evening rebecca comella 33 also that decided morning another woman 21 remains hospital fighting for her life so there's three people currently that were obviously in critical condition two have passed away and one's fighting for their life absolutely tragic man you cannot imagine how tragic that is so 
this is definitely a wider conversation to be had around you know safety about these events i don't think it's a conversation that should be specifically tailored towards black people i've seen a lot of that conversation or narrative go around i feel like if you see the amount of events that have had trouble you know especially in the last couple of years or so especially off the back of the pandemic and people just not knowing how to act once the restrictions were lifted i don't think it's un i don't think it's that far-fetched to say that two and a half years that we were basically you know out of practice in terms of being in big groups has essentially led to these unfortunate events happening but i don't think it's a problem you can say is only affecting the black community i think there's too many events out there um that this type of things happen at obviously if you're only worried about your own community it's definitely something to worry about because i feel like a lot of people myself included saw the videos of ashaki's performance earlier on in the week at brixton academy like this video of this dancer dancing on stage covered in what looks like water. all right covered in what looks like water dancing on stage i think this is a, a element of the entire show if i'm not mistaken there'd always be a dancer that he'd bring out maybe this is a professional guy don't get me wrong but the on the other occasion there was like a person that would come out who was maybe a viral star who went you know famous for lip syncing or dancing to a particular song and he'd bring them out on stage and people would be like, oh my god look it's that person on tiktok and whatnot that'd be a cool element to kind of add to the overall show and you get to see them on the screen behind their massive beam in front of you this is pretty cool but I feel like these videos and other videos, they really gave you a, a sense of how um, expansive the show was. Like he had a full band on there. There's fire flames. There's a stage design. This guy's covered in what look, looks like a, there's an overhead shower or something there. Like legitimately, he went hard in the paint production wise. And these are the kind of shows that you want to go to because it looks like the type of thing where maybe they're not they're not even in the red they probably don't make that much money off these type of shows because everything goes into production. But the quality of the show is so good that it makes the price of admission fully fully worth it and all the hassle in terms of like queuing and going out so this is one of those rare occasions where somebody's ability to put on a great show has essentially added to the hype and the law or the the anticipation for the event and all these people that didn't have tickets tried to chance it on a night and then that ended up causing an absolute clusterfuck of a situation that led to people's lives you know losing their lives basically at this event I'd say if you definitely went there without a ticket, you bes you definitely have to feel some level of guilt. But if not, go as far as saying you have blood on your hands. That's a bit extreme and a little, maybe a little bit too OTT. But for sure, you have to feel some level of guilt that you may inadvertently put people's lives at risk to the point where they legitimately lost their lives. Like it's absolutely wild to think that. And if, even if there are reports are like 500 people extra that came without tickets, you can just imagine all the people that, because I'd imagine if you don't have a ticket, you're going to come early just to slip in. So people might have slipped in with fake tickets or bribed bouncers because that happens a lot in London venues. Unfortunately, um, a lot of these bouncers will willingly take money from people and let them kind of bounce a queue and let them come in without any ticket so imagine all the people that arrive there with no tickets and you're arriving on time thinking that you're gonna skip the openers and you want to move all the other dj stuff and you want to see the main show you turn up and you see a big horde of people outside trying to push and be aggro and stuff and you start getting involved because you legitimately paid for yours maybe you've you paid double the price or whatnot, or triple, and you kind of add to the whole conundrum. I can just imagine it just being an entirely a shit show, especially because I've been at Brixton Academy a few times, and I know how rowdy and how uncontrollable it can get outside of that venue, especially if it being on the corner of the street, with there being sort of multiple entrances, not really, but kind of. It's kind of, it's a sort, it's a hard place to do a lot of crowd management and try to make that work, especially if people decide to turn up. So, definitely a conversation worth having in that regard but i just feel like the focus should always be on the victims so you know r.i.p to gabby hutchinson only 23 years old absolute tragedy and also r.i.p to rebecca ukumelo man absolute horrific i can't imagine what their family are going for just before christmas to have this thing happen um especially when you take into account you know rebecca being a mother of two like thoughts and feelings and prayers go out to the flipping kids and obviously um for gabby hutchinson the family you leave behind also only being 20 23 years of age earning some money on the side and doing your bit and then now suddenly you lost your life because you're trying to essentially you're putting your life at risk trying to protect the audience and punters and whatnot and it ends up costing you your life absolutely horrendous and 
I don't know who's to blame. I really don't know. I really don't know who's to blame in this effect. Um, because I feel like, you know, good crime management, even if you get an abundance of people, you can maybe maintain it. That would work. I feel like maybe security guards party to blame. A lot of the people that went there, that tickets are to blame also. Um, so I don't know what's going to happen. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of lawsuits around this stuff and whatnot. And it might eventually even lead to the flipping closing of Brixton Academy. I can definitely see that happening if they deem it not to be fit for purpose. But absolute tragedy man absolute tragedy so r.i.p to the victims r.i.p to the victims next up we're going to touch upon these salihi Bembry wallabies they look pretty cool not gonna lie um you know i've had my uh love hate relationship with salihi Bembry and his approach to releasing stuff and basically in he kind of feels like he enjoys making it but doesn't care too tough about the release you know whoever gets them gets them and if you don't get them you know oh well <laughs> it is what it is but these clark shoes that he's put together look really really impressive they kind of remind me of the old padmore is it Padmore Barnes? I think Clark Wallabies from back in the days. Um, I forgot the name of it, but there's a particular brand, a particular model of a Wallaby that you used to get where the laces were on the side. And I remember them being very popular. If I remember correctly, Supreme may have done a collaboration with Clark's with that kind of model, if I'm not mistaken. Let me see if I can quickly find it. So it's a Supreme Clark's collab. I'm sure they did one. It sort of had the laces on the side as well. I'm not sure what that model is actually called. But they were really, really cool design. I remember having a pair in brown, um, this suede brand that I bought from Clark's as well, because that was a time when they used to kind of put those um, models out. But let me see if I can find them. I think it was a Clark's collaboration with Supreme. Let me see if I can find them with the images here. Scrolling. Oh, look at those Prada moon boots here on the top. They look really cool, isn't it? These ones there. Prada nylon gabardine boots. Ooh, après. Um, anyway, let's continue on here. What have you got here? We've got these ones that look like espadrilles. They're horrible. We've got bandana ones. You've got ones that are maybe more Wu-Tang inspired here with the color blocking. I want to see the ones I'm talking about. The ones that have like the laces on the side. I can't actually see them here, but they definitely did one, if I'm mistaken. They are mistaken, or maybe I'm thinking about these with these two little eyelets really high up. I do remember them doing ones with a side on them. Or maybe that's a different one. Let me see here. Oh, I can't see them anywhere, actually. Okay, maybe I was maybe I was smoking on that good budge, and I don't remember them being there. But I do remember them. Let's see. Let's see if I can do, um, pad more, and Barnes, clerk. Let's see if I can do that. Let's see if that maybe come might come up. Uh, pad more and Barnes. Uh, let's see here. Nope. 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 Ooh, this I, I don't know what the, I wish I could find out what the model of them is called. If you know, let me know. But look, there's definitely these are the pairs I had. I remember having a couple of these nutmeggy brown ones here in the middle, or these Padmore Barnes Clarks, really, 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 really well made. The only reason I hate wallabies wearing them rise is the is the sole, especially if someone like me likes to wear shit into the ground. These are like men's version of UGG boots. The sole wears down so so quickly, and especially if you walk like I do, like an absolute S word. You end up kind of making them go really, you know, some weird angular shape on the side. It kind of reminds me of when I was in school. You'd have your kind of shoes leaning to one side because of all the pressure you're putting them on that side. So that can be a little bit, you know, of a bummer. These are my, the, the ones I hated the most were these that kind of had this little uh, tip. This little thing that kind of raised up on the front. I thought they they'd look always really, really disgusting. But I can't find the ones with the laces on the side. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Let's go back to the Hypebeast article. Hi, Snobiety, sorry. These ones from Salili Bembry, I'm a really big fan of. I like whatever he's done here on the front, where it looks like a paint splatter mixed in with this really hairy, coarse-looking suede nubuck material that kind of bleeds or blends into a somewhat plain, smoothed um, suede material on the side. And this kind of exaggerated, thicker outsole, which reminds me a lot of the human-made or bape type of shoes that used to come out. I forgot what they were called. It's like these human made, let's see if I can find those, human made wallabies. Nigo used to make a lot of these for like, for babe back in the day. They were like these kind of shoes that had like, they had like a really thicker outsole. I'm not sure what the model of it is called, but I remember them having a really weird thick outsole that sort of stuck out on the side, like sort of similar to that sort of thing. Here, they kind of had a bit of a maybe we call it a crepe, so I'm not sure what it's called that, but it essentially had excess on the side because usually wallabies they kind of fall flush or they kind of you know are a bit tempered on the sides. But I felt like those human ones were a little bit more. Uh, let's see if I can find Nico Bape, uh, 
like wallabies or crep soles, crep shoes. Maybe that will come up there. Let's see if these were the ones. But I remember these being a thing for a while. Can I find these here? They were sort of like an exaggerated outsole on the outside of them that he used to do for bait back in the day. They were really, really cool to look at. Um, but, you know, they weren't really that readily available outside of Japan when they were first made sizes and whatnot. But after time they did. But then, you know, paying 300 quid for that type of shoe when you can get a regular clocks on probably wasn't the vibe. But anyway, I can't find them. Don't know why they are, but believe me, they exist. Right? <laughs> believe me. Again, look at the Bapes of the colorway. This is what these guys are missing out on, right? In my opinion, I feel like all these guys that are making the copies of, you know, Supreme, you know, regular Nike shoes and just basically making the same colorway and just adding a star on it just missed the entire point i feel like what made beta special was that the colorways are so obscene so ridiculous that they couldn't be nikes even if you mistake the silhouette and the paneling for an air force one there's no way you can confuse a babester um for an air force one because it was a babester right the, the pan the no nike would never do that even now with the abundance of sneakerheads out there and uh you know sneaker industry being a billion dollar industry nike still don't make crazy wild regular gr air force ones they have to always be collabs like the undefeated ones that came out recently but they don't ever really make crazy normal you know walk into jd sports and see like you know like this color where we've got like an all white base for the most part with a blue mud guard orange eye orange eye stay kind of paneling um green heel tab suede with the logo embossed leather star and two-tone heel tab here you got pink and a black and white insole all white outsole like absolutely banging like i think that sole's even a bit thicker than air force one you don't ever ever see that from flipping these guys that copied the nike design it's so frustrating but anyway let's run back to the casali Bembry things i think these look pretty sick man i'm a, I'm a big fan of these i'm eager to see one of these drops so it's courtesy of high snobiety Sally Bembry's class collab is definitely not a wallaby um is Ali Benbury collaborating with Clarks? Yes, is it Wallaby? Absolutely not. With only one image to go so to go by so far, which comes directly from Benbury's IG. The silhouette in question is the most definitely not a Wallaby, but instead a new style that looks to take inspiration for the Clarks Lugger design first released in the eighties. Let's see this. If it's clear, let's see if this is true. Because I might be the one I'm thinking of. Because I remember having a pair. I I'm pretty sure I've got it on my flicker. Um, yeah, that's the one. Yeah, that's definitely the one I've got. Okay, cool. This is definitely the one. I've got one of these ones. And I had a Padmore Barnes pair. So it's called a Lugger. That's the model. So it's whatever that is here on the side, as you can see here. There's one here, courtesy of List. That's like an orange suede model with like no lining, which is definitely a pair that you can only wear if you're white. Because you, I feel like white people's feet don't stick as black, much as black people's feet. <laughs> or I don't feel I can wear shoes without no socks for the most part, unless I want my feet to kick. But this has got, you know, a pair with no lining on it. So it's kind of a similar sort of vibe, but they do look absolutely banging. I feel like in terms of a shoe, maybe some people would disagree, but I do like that kind of side loafery type of look in them. And I feel like, you know, Salili did a good job in terms of making them look a bit more rugged and a little bit more substantial. And it continues, says, rework by Benbury um to form a new oblite nameless um at this stage silhouette the shoe arrives with a cozy fuzzy red upper blue decorations towards the front with laces slouched to one side both on the both of which sit atop a slightly enlarged crepe sole um at the time of writing drop information is yet to be announced but if previous car collaborations are anything to go by at least it's only around the corner um that being said clarks looks to have a lot of more in the plate right now with the vanny the pink release and what looks like an upcoming collaboration with liam gallagher yeah but we don't care about liam gallagher and like that come on but yeah um the class collaboration looks brilliant i'm on it i'm a big fan I like what i see there like what i see there and then of course continuing on from the Salidi Benbury news we have to talk about the new balance 990 version 2 that he put out or that are due to drop very very soon these look absolutely lush like legitimately lush that's the only way i could describe them lush exquisite beautiful um just oh the that whatever that fuzzy suede thing is that brush suede that he puts on the top that is really good obviously maybe there's some tie-in story-wise in terms of aesthetic and color blocking when it comes to this and the clerks maybe but whatever this upper is is sort of essentially like i said like a fuzzy new a fuzzy suede or something like that kind of lines it's so good you've got this um 
material here on the end as well, which is some something you'd see, you know, on the uh, what's it called? A pleex is that called a pleex or lettering on varsity jackets? Um, the addition of this 3M little hit here on the front. I think it's 3M towards the front here is really nice. You've got the addition of this really amazing mesh, which looks like a plastic mesh webbing with an underneath of mesh underneath. So it kind of gives it this sort of like um suck dark kind of a feel which is quite cool i do like the addition of this toe tone on the front here you've got this kind of washed out pink and this sort of like violet here which kind of gives it a good hit i feel like Salidi benbury does a good job with the laces and the thickness of them i feel like these would be a good length lace and the weight to kind of tie these and make them look disgustingly good the little label here with his name on it is a nice little um you know, nice, nice little narcissistic hit there to remind everybody that you're not uh, some regular Joe. So I do like the look of those, but they legitimately might be my favorite so far that I've seen from him. And they legitimately look nice, like legit. And that's because I'm obviously a huge fan of the 990 52s. Definitely might be up there with my favorite all-time New Balance model, maybe up there with the classic 574s. But Jesus, these looks go so good. Look at that. That is buttery, isn't it? That's what you can call it, buttery. It kind of reminds me of the first time I saw the Pata Air Max 1s. I think, oh, so refreshing. This looks really cool because, again, this 990 V2, I feel like, has been oversaturated. Or maybe New Balance has been oversaturated. I feel like I've seen too many New Balances out there on the market, and it's getting a bit boring. But when they do it right, they do it right. And this collab is really up there, man. This is so nice. It's basically all pink for the most part. Um, yeah, you call that all pink, right? Pinks, purples uh peaches maybe you might call it burnt oranges or something like that right like oh but whatever it is i'm a big fan of them and i really really want a pair these look so good and then i think that's his motif or logo or what not right branding it kind of looks like if i'm not mistaken the fingerprint mark that's on the top of the crocs that kind of swell design so you see that obviously applied on the heel tab which is quite cool little hit there i like that i'm not gonna lie i really do like that and in the laces, it comes with pink, it comes with white, and it also comes with that orangey type lace. And I like this mesh. See this mesh here at the front? This is such a good idea. It's sort of like, like I said, like it looks like a sort of plasticky type mesh or net that you would see, you know, from a net. And then underneath it, you got this kind of type of mesh underneath it. So you got this double layer mesh going on, which is fucking brilliant. So maybe this might be a perfect shoe to wear if you actually got no flipping socks on. Because all your flipping funky feet smell can kind of, you know, slowly seep through the little mesh holes. But I think this looks banging. This is definitely my favorite of his collaborations so far. He definitely smashes one out of the park. This looks so good. Oh, the little cork insoles. Well, that was a nice little hit there. I like that. I'm not going to lie. I really, really like that. And I'm a big fan also of the, you know, the classic sort of uh, logo design when it comes to your name and just having it in a really cool font. Instead of having all the bells, whistles and whatnot, it just can easily be stamped and branded on certain places. I'm sure this is a custom font that you probably put together by like this and how it sits there alongside the flipping New Balance logo. It'll be interesting to see if he ends up doing more stuff long term with New Balance, if he ends up doing like a Teddy Santis type of vibe. Obviously, I know he's the creative director of New Balance USA, but I wonder if New Balance will ever think, hey, let's bring this Lee Bembry guy in the house and start giving him more silhouettes to sort of like, you know, funk up and give it a little bit of an, um, what you think called eccentric sort of vibe. That's what I think he does really well. He has sort of ability to take really mundane, classic, somewhat boring New Balance silhouettes and kind of, you know, give them a bit of jazz, give them a bit of razzmatazz, make them look like, you know, somebody that enjoys going to Afro punks, hiking, maybe taking too many hits of DMT and hangs around with Anwar Carrots. You know what I mean? Those type of vibe guys, I feel like they designed these type of things really well. But this looks booming. Even this just little picture thing, right? There's a picture here on the screen of all the, you know, different angles of the shoe put together in a little Photoshop flipping layout. And one of the pictures has the laces kind of swirled in this sort of curl print, or code design on the top of the of the shoe. It's nothing serious, don't get me wrong, but just tying into everything about it and, you know, naturey vibe and whatever it may be, the sand dune vibes of it, right? It just looks really cool. Maybe this is something that um Timothy Chamelet's character in flipping Dune would have worn. You know what I mean? When he's not out there trying to, you know, kill people with his little knife and trying to bag all the hoes, he's maybe wearing a pair of Sully Benbury's 990 V2. Who knows? But this is courtesy of Hypebeast. It says, first revealed in June, Sully Benbury's continue his triumph for collaborative 
run with New Balance by outfitting the 990 V2s in a multicolored look of pink, orange, and purple. The revered designer, best known for his much anticipated footwear collaborations, expands his journey with a brand after working with Vans, Montclair, and Crocs. And also, that's also another thing to say in it. Like, I like this. He's taking the approach that I will take, which is, you know, my North Star and my kind of person I always looked up to was the likes of Hiroshi Fujiwara and his ability to basically work with different brands in terms of footwear. He never just did. Obviously, he's very well aligned and kind of known for his Nike collaboration, especially some of the HTM stuff back in the day. But I still feel like he had the luck and the ability and maybe the license to do these other brand collaborations, which essentially is what made him the legend that he is. And it's something you don't see a lot of people do. A lot of people want to get in bed with brands like Nike or Adidas and just stay with them. And I feel like sometimes maybe taking brand deals or collaboration deals with the sort of other brands who people don't really look at too much, like the Reeboks and the Pumas and the Asics and, you know, uh, the New Balances and whatnot, the Feelers, because they're not that well known or they're not that popular, you can maybe, and maybe because you're coming into the agreement with a little bit more leverage, you can maybe negotiate an ability to not have a super long or crazy exclusivity deal where you can't work with another footwear brand for another year or something. Or maybe just you don't have any exclusivity deal and you can just basically work in tandem and just give them grace in terms of allowing them time to promote the one shoe before you drop the other one. But I feel like they all go hand in hand because if I see. Because if I'm a fan of Sully Benbury, personally for me, if I'm a fan of him and his design work and his design ethos and his practice and his ability to put cool ideas onto footwear, I don't care if it's a Croc, if it's a Fila, if it's a Mizuno, if it's a Deodora, if it's a Kuru, if it's a Veja, what, I don't care what it is, I'm going to buy it because I'm a fan of what he does. So if anything, all those collaborations kind of feed off each other. They kind of add to the hype because I feel like this New Balance probably wouldn't have been as popular if that croc wasn't such a pit and, you know, vis-a-vis -vis the New Balance. So same sort of thing. So I feel like this is a real crazy, sick thing that he's done. And hopefully these brands will recognize the power of these, you know, amazing new gen creatives and designers and whatnot and give them more room to do things with other brands because I feel like they all feed into each other. Honestly, I really, really do. I don't feel like they take, you know, they take up any retail space or they take up any of the buying decisions. I feel like a kid that would spend money on a pair of Crocs would also buy a New Balance anyway because there's so many shoes that come out around the year, all, re all year round that people go goo go, go over, especially some of the retros. There's no shortage people willing to buy. So this idea that people are only going to buy once or you might affect the ability to sell certain items, it just doesn't make any sense. So give these guys more collaborations, more products, please. This take on a New Balance seats a reflective uh, runner effectively utilizing its layered design with various up... Uh, with various colors appear throughout the mesh suede and leather upper um but yeah you can see them there i think what's the date is it got a date already i think we have a date right yeah reach date here it's getting courtesy of hype beast look at the official picture with it appearing on this sort of sand dune that looks incredible right it looks like a desert somewhere like somewhere in america i'm assuming the only thing i don't like about this picture number one my always main complaint when it comes to footwear product pictures is the lacing come on man you're going to go to all this effort to Photoshop this amazing picture in this amazing landscape or whatnot. And then you don't have the, you know, the, 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 the decency just to relace those laces. Like, come on, like, come on, relace the shoes, man. Come on. This looks horrendous. Who laces, who goes out wearing their shoes like that straight from the box? You're an absolute psycho if you do that, by the way. If you legitimately get shoes from the box and just put them on and wear them just like that, you're a psycho. You are a psycho. Relace your shoes. Like, make them look at, you know what I mean? Drop them a bit. Like, give them a bit of a pizzazz. Um, these, anyway, these are going to make, meant to come out um, December 22nd and they're priced at $200. The sneaker with coral pink is inspired by the sand dunes of South U Southern Utah. Okay, let's let's see that. Let's see that is true. Because people like saying it. This is like when people put, like, loads of heady words in flipping, um, you know, car, in flipping cards or the leaflets or menus for flipping art galleries and you look at the painting, it's like, that doesn't look like anything that you described in those flipping words. But hey, let's quickly check this and see if this is true. Let's see, Southern Utah, was it Sand Dunes, right? Sand Dunes. Let's see if this is true. Because he's making it seem like it looks like all pinky and purpley type of vibe. Let's see if this is true. Oh, it is actually true. <laughs> look at this, which is, it actually is true. The sand dunes of southern Utah do have the same color palette as Salili Benbury's 990 V2s. They look exactly the same. Loads of oranges, loads. And imagine seeing it with your actual eyes, IRL, you definitely get a lot of the burnt oranges, a lot of the purple pinks. Look at that. The pink vibe, pink sand dunes, coral pink. 
that's actually quite cool i'm not going to lie so one day i guess in you know in in his you know escapades out there in the flipping in the world you know which is nice to see also because i feel like that's probably a good inspiration for the kids coming up so they're not all going to the same free locations that everyone flipping travels to which is definitely worth to tyler the creator and tyler Sidney benbury for inspiring kids to go outside of the usual three or four locations so i'm guessing once he was out there he maybe just decided hey this would be a good color palette for a flipping color of a shoe and he took that and applied that onto a shoe which is pretty sick to see to be honest i imagine if that could be a thing that you could do in nike id imagine if you could you know how you can do like search on google by image imagine there was an option on on nike id where you could take a picture of something like a let's say a, a tree with flowers blossoming and it would give you um different variations of colorways that you could apply on a silhouette like an air force one it take those colors and it sort of like plot them in different places and make and give you like a few alternates that you kind of pick from that'd be pretty sick because i'm guessing a lot of people that do nike id stuff you know like we all do you start off with this wacky crazy idea then after a while you just get bored of it it just don't look that great because you want yours to not look because i know with me when i did our nike ids you never want them to look too id-ish you want them to look at something that someone would actually make because it gave you a little bit of a a little bit of a it gave you a bit of an ego boost that someone would think these were released because it means that you are designed a colorway good enough to be worthy of being sold by a brand like Nike. But I feel like if someone could just give you an app that would maybe keep pull whatever, you know, pull the colors from a picture and essentially plot them on the shoe, that would be sick. That would be a great new way to kind of take things to the next level and those kind of ID type uh, programs that they have out there. But yeah, he's right about the sand dunes. Um, after release and immediate sellout on the on the Sponge website, the Salib Embry V2 Sandy will be touched down again later. This okay, so there's two drops. Um, learn more about the shoe rollout and campaign construction. Read the original story below. Of course, we've got that. We've got Thundercat modeling it also. Hopefully, it's not registered licensed music. Let's play it. See what I'm saying because I love Thundercat. <laughs> Yeah, not going to play that, but you know what it is. Definitely going to be licensed music, but it looks pretty good. It's called Sand Be The Time, New Balance 990 V2, December 8th. Already did done already. Loads of, you know, good hits there in terms of giving people promo and whatnot. But yeah, it looks cool. Love it. Um, really good. Um, yeah, nappiness of the suede, someone said in the comments. is funny in the hypey's comments. Love the nappiness of the suede, bro. <laughs> Has anyone gone to the Sponge website yet? It appears to have subscribed and need a password to enter. I like these much better than these 574s and both two, 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 yeah, of course the 2002 RSs are, were terrible to be honest. They may be his worst things he put out. Just something about them which is really appealing. I'm not too sure why. The color is just banging. Let's be honest. The color is absolutely flames. He absolutely smashed it. So I'm a big fan of these. Um, obviously try and get them when they come out again a second time. Let's see if I'm lucky enough to get a pair let's see if i'm lucky enough to get a pair <laughs> oh yeah and i wanted to talk about this quickly so i've been a somewhat critical um, of Jack Moose, the brand, obviously Jack Moose, you guys know Jack Moose and what they're about, but mostly my objection to Jack Moose has been in comparison with some of the stick I feel like some of my, you know, people that I'm big fans of, like Matthew Williams, that, you know, Juvon Shi, um, Louis, you know, Virgil Abloh, Louis Vuitton, RIP to him, and a few others, I feel like we're getting unfair stick considering some of the mediocrity that Simon Bort was putting out on the runway for Jack Moose. I feel like it was really, really um, going kind of unsaid that he kind of lost a little bit of the sparkle that made him special. You think of some of those early Jack Moose collections, the one with the horse, you think of that iconic, you know, I think it was spring 2018 one where the big straw hat and just the, you know, the sensuality, the the sort of vibe that also that kind of bled through the clothes. It sort of seemed desirable. It gave you wonderlust. It gave you um, travel, FOMO, whatever that flipping thing is called, or maybe it is called wonderlust. Whatever it may be, it evoked a sign of emotion. You wanted to be those girls. You wanted to wear those outfits. You wanted to feel the way that they felt, or you wanted to feel how it felt to wear those clothes. You know, walking down the French Ferry Riviera, wherever it may be. But he definitely was able to capture that and kind of funnel it through for clothes for some reason he lost his way i feel like after 2018 it kind of went all over the place i think the the kind of summation of that was that nike collaboration 
right? You remember that Nike collaboration? Everyone was trying to pretend was good. He done a Nike collaboration with Nike ACG of all things, which is absolutely insane. There's no way anybody would ever think a Jack Moose girl was out there climbing rocks, right? Was out there, tra you know, trapezing over flipping uh, sand dunes and whatnot. That's not happening. Those girls are at resorts. They're at flipping cobbled streets in some city center somewhere, but they're nowhere near some sort of hillside hanging by their fingertips with chalk and whatnot. That's not happening. So that whole ACG vibe for me was an absolute dud. And I feel like he's had many dud collections, many, many dud collections. But for some reason, for some reason, for some reason, this guy turned it around. And I think it must be just talent. When you're just talented and you got the it factor, you can have some dodgy collections here or there, but you suddenly are able to kind of pull it back in. And maybe it's just a question of him not having much inspiration and maybe not feeling like he was really with it or whatnot. But I don't know what happened. But suddenly out of nowhere, the spring 2023 collection just absolutely went back to everything that I loved about Jack Moose. And if anything, it kind of felt like a refresh of the brand and even more so when i think of the activations around it they had an entire an entire event um kind of basically a, a party at a club where if i'm not mistaken something like a thousand people or something went to it was live streamed on flipping boiler room right you can see here on the screen we've got all these different sets from these different artists that played there and they be my gal brodo ramses and juni pushy don't get me wrong a lot of these streams are flipping in duds right the sets aren't that great not the type of music i'd ever go out and party to or if i would you know whatever just kind of standard club music that you'd maybe hear in a really cool bar somewhere but not anything you know that's going to really push anything forward but still there was a clear club vibe in there and it felt fun it felt loose it felt culturally relevant it felt niggery right in a good way and it really made me think like when did that change when did jack moose go from being a real whitewash parisian sort of like um uh, somewhat socialite vibe to because i remember even the early collections he said he was always inspired by like his mum's friend so he went from being this kind of like i don't know uh this sort of 40 year old plus lady in you know living in some you know lovely leafy town somewhere in the middle of Lyon somewhere and then then suddenly it became something that was intrinsically tied to the streets just with still the air of that kind of you know looseness and sensuality that you kind of known um for Jack Moose to be about I wonder if it was something that was purposely done because you know I love Simon Bart. I think he's cool. No, I don't think he's cool. I think he he's obviously incredibly talented and knows how to really make amazing, sensual, amazing, sexy clothes. But let's not, you know, let's not be around the bush. I don't necessarily think he's cool. He doesn't necessarily strike me as somebody that has the cool factor around it, like a like a Matthew Williams or like a Virgil Abloh R.I.P. But somehow around, he just switched, and now he's basically become cool by what he's basically done everything around the collection and the shows and you know all the vips that arrived and whatnot and what it looks like on a runway there's just something very intrinsically there's like it feels like a shift has happened about the brand i wonder what it is did it was there somebody that they've recently hired in the com communication side of things or the activation side of things or the marketing side of things or the influence side of things like what's happened at simon pot as what's happened at jack moose that's just changed things around because it's definitely got a lot more culture attached to it and it feels cool to see it feels like a real refresh of what i've seen prior like on the screen here we've got a picture of someone called christine queen we've got a picture of someone called richie shazam everyone looking really cool you got iris lord there looking really splendid like just loads of really amazingly cool looking people that arrived at the show you've got here jenny from uh, black pink looking great you've got um emma chamberlain looking not so good but still looking it's just it feels like a core cool section of people that are there at this event and something that you would never really ascribe to um jack moose in the slightest and i wonder what's happened i really do wonder what's happened i wonder if this is a an occasion similar to what happened with Bottega veneta where daniel lee started to kind of uh, you know um, appease or started to maybe go out of his way to be a brand that maybe represented black people in some sort of weird way but i feel like this isn't even like a black thing it's just more like a culture thing like he just feels like he's more tapped in more loose something i don't know what's happened maybe it's an epiphany maybe it was always there and i missed it but i feel like this brand is way more on point and has this kind of finger on the button and is responding to things in a great without actually kind of you know um 
not patronizing without maybe dumbing down what they do is still able to kind of appeal to people that would you would describe as a cool club of kids out there and it looks really really splendid and like i said beforehand i wasn't a big critic of the guy and i feel like he lost his way and considering what i've seen from what's his name um, ricardo tishi and the absolute trust that he was dribbling out there and flipping Burberry when you consider how talented he was the stuff he was doing at Givenchy beforehand I feel like he was going to go the same way I feel like oh he might be one of the designers who's not able to ever turn it around but somehow he did and it looks absolutely banging this might be legit one of the best collaboration one of the best like, collections I've seen from Jack Moose since the epic show in 2018 there's not because everything else in between has been absolutely shite um, some of the hats some of the colours some of the shapes silhouettes just absolutely beautiful absolutely exquisite love everything about it would wear everything in this collection especially some of the men's looks look really really sensual there's one particular one that makes me think i wonder because I, I don't think it's true because i'm pretty sure i saw a picture of simon Bart getting engaged to a guy that looks very similar to him and very handsome as well and he wasn't black but it gives me a, a reason to think that i wonder if he's got you know i don't know if he suddenly started hanging around with normal people and that's what basically made him be able to design these clothes and maybe he was hanging around with too many of his mom's friends that's why he's putting out all those dead boring collections but now he's legitimately got friends that are his age from all around the world like a proper multicultural group of people that he's gallivanting the parisian streets around with that's made it different but there's one particular detail that i think might give me an inkling or maybe he's just discovered you know he thinks black people are cool now suddenly i'm not too sure but there's one particular look i want to just see that may kind of be lending myself to it maybe even this kind of look you know with these massive straw hay type looking hats on top which kind of giving you jamiroquai maybe giving you 70s funk type of vibe in terms of how extravagant and extra they are but there's this one particular look that i'm trying to get to and look and it's another really cool raf simmons prada s type of vibe with these sort of like wraps that go around the body i saw that a lot and obviously some of these trucker hats and these bucket hat things look really cool i wish i could wear them but they never look as good on me as they do on these models unfortunately another big floppy straw hat you know he's you know if, if it's not broke if it's not broke don't fix it i get but where is this look I want to see here? There we go. So look 31 of the Jack Moose Spring Summer 2023 collection. There's this really cool look with this amazing cropped uh, polo with this really exaggerated uh button bit here where you know a normal polo top would have a small little two button thing this is like it's been really kind of enlarged to kind of take up a lot of the retail space in the front of your flipping chest so it's really big and you've got this really exaggerated front pocket and it kind of sits up a bit but if you look here this kind of and again maybe this is just i think this is maybe a vest so it maybe isn't underwear but it's kind of giving like you know when you know black people wear their trousers low rise with the boxes showing and exposed especially this kind of baggy look this is maybe making me think that something happened behind the scenes like a reset maybe he got some different people in his mood board or whatnot or i don't know what happened but this is definitely giving the idea that i'm thinking of yeah maybe he's starting to try to tap into the streets and start to look around his environment a lot more tapping into things that were maybe not so caucasian and whitewashed and that's what maybe led to this little styling um hit in this collection because i feel like this is something that you would have never seen in any other um jack moose collection definitely not and i love it again it could just be a, a vest top or maybe it could be some leggings that have been pulled up but i do like this little styling tip here with these little exposed because it definitely does look like something that you would see um someone like myself wearing that huh? an icy free male as you can see here that looks fucking splendid look at that i love that i love that kind of like playful um top where you've got this sort of like amazing vest top that looks like it's got a somewhat glittery bra type design with this little uh armband here detailed aside with the i think that's probably a silk scarf just wrapped around the model's arm and then one of the little tops tucked into the box of shorts i think it looks like right man's piece is not hanging out this is nice to see but it just looks really cool you've got this really sensual um, effeminate type of top and it matched up with this i feel like you know what you describe as a hyper masculinity bottom right these baggy jeans with these pockets on the side kind of like you know jack moose's version of a double knee pant it feels like and these crazy what look like to be his version of um birkenstock it looks like a little bit maybe some mule i'm not too sure and it's great tote bag this is one of the greatest honestly definitely smash out of the park big up jack moose um spring 2023 collection definitely one of my favorites and you can see here a clip here of uh black pinch jenny 
um, at the party also and Jack Moose on full form standing on top of tables and stuff on the mic really kind of giving it all at the party which looked absolutely fun this is one of the rare fashion parties I've seen that looked legitimately fun mostly things look like absolute ball fest but this looks like a legit rave so maybe Jack Moose is just going out more in party. I don't know but something definitely changed let's play the video Jenny Yes, this is this taken obviously from a BTS or Blackpink fan channel it's a Blackpink runner um, this is Blackpink Jenny at Jack Moose after party in Paris because everyone was going crazy at her dancing and having a good time I'm not too sure why maybe it's just stand them maybe because they don't go out because they're not allowed out I'm not too sure but the fans of Blackpink were going absolutely crazy at Jenny being at this flipping event <laughs> and big up jenny's friend whoever this other girl is next to her who did not let her get out of her sight i think the comments are saying either they are quote-unquote you know friends or um she was getting way too much attention jenny from you know creeps around there who were just looking at her thinking oh my god this lady's absolutely mesmerizing in real life and trying to get near her and her friend was doing what good friends should do and cop blocking the shit out of them so she did not let that girl leave her sight in any way shape or form as you can see arms wrapped around her hands on top whatever it may be no other guys coming alongside say oh excuse me are you no fuck off <laughs> Come on, dancer. Simon Pod trying to, like, again, I don't think this is maybe it's just me because I just look in from the outside in. But I, it, this is similar to, like, if, um, what's his face, uh, from Luebe started to do the same thing. It's been a little bit corny. I mean, cause you don't get the feeling that they're like these type of people. Um, they're not, uh, I don't, I don't imagine, I don't know. I just don't feel like he's a, he's a party in any kind of way, shape, or form. But maybe he has, maybe he always was be that type of guy. But him getting on the mic and being this kind of character is hilarious, in my opinion. But again, um, you know, do what you have to do in a party, get people turn up. It's just a shame whether on the front there's just staring at Jenny clearly because they're flipping, standing out, and all the other celebrities are behind them. Looks fun, though, doesn't it? Looks fucking fun. Oh. What counts is a party? <laughs> Welcome to Jenny! If there's one thing I hate in a club is when someone gets on the mic. Honestly, it's the biggest vibe killer of all, man. Shut the fuck up. Usually, you have to be really good at it. It's like a definite skill to be able to, like, get on the mic and hype up the crowd and be the MC. If you're not actually, you know, spitting bars, it's pretty hard to do well. But, God damn it, for the most part, just allow it. Make some noise for Jenny, Elix. please! Elix. Oh. Here we are, Zach Moose! I'd risk it all, by the way. I'd risk it all. Okay, no more, no more, no more! Jesus Christ, Jenny, I'm glad to see Jenny having fun. She must have been tired after three hours of concert. Yeah, I don't know, man. This this sort of parasocial relationship these stands have with these flipping K-pop stars is flipping bizarre, to say the least. There's images of her arriving at the show also looking great. <laughs> Anyway, you get the vibe. You get the vibe. Um, Jack Musa clearly doing something different. Something has changed. I'm not too sure what, like I said beforehand, but something has definitely changed in the background. I feel like the review of the show was absolutely hilarious, though. There's a bit that really made me think that maybe he has just got some regular friends and now he's being inspired by other things outside of just hanging around with his rich mum friends and stuff. Um, or, with, you know, his friends, you know, mum's friends. But this is part of the review from Vogue Runway that really made me laugh that I read earlier on. That thought was hilarious. Where's the line? Um, ba, 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 ba. Where is there's a line here? Something about regular people. Let me see. Uh, is it something about relatable? Let's see if I can get up on here. Relay. Relay. 
There we go. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Port Jack Moose is famed for his love of creating environmental scenarios and for projecting the imagery with which he's gathered on adoring public around him. Friends and influencers turned up at Le Bourget, um, already dressed in the collection that was on the runway. Others were wearing pieces from one he had showed in June. The quote, you know, often they go more viral than the show, he observed, smiling as he watched them walk in on the backstage monitor. It's different. Dressing real people who are not models. I love it. People find them relatable. <laughs> so this whole time, the only friends he had were models or his really you know bougie socialite hippie richie mum's friends but now that he's got some non-model non-rich people friends he's suddenly finding them a lot more relatable they're fun these normal people they have these these things called problems and these things called bills that they worry about so it's kind of fun to kind of allow them to kind of detach from that reality and just kind of wonder and have some exploration and fun and stuff <laughs> Um, another one here somehow his talent for the humorous exaggeration and for the French romance and combined with his down to earth instinct for reality this collection in the last gasp of 2022 showed all that at his best and tomorrow it starts to drop he says not everything but people should ha shouldn't have to wait so obviously he's gonna he's kind of changing how it releases also but I find this to be a false I don't feel like he's anything I don't he's probably not down to earth if you look at the shows there's a lot of kind of transportation you kind of get transported to a different world when you kind of watch these shows but now it feels like they are kind of grounded in some level of reality even though again you film them you know there's a show on location out of the way whatever a bit lux a bit whatever but still there's something kind of real about the whole event and maybe it's just to do with the people invited to the show the overall vibe but I just feel like something has definitely changed with it. And I wonder what it is. Maybe someone got involved in the creative director role, um, whatever it may be. But something has definitely changed. That's definitely made it a lot more appealing to someone like myself who maybe wasn't the biggest Simon Bot believer. But I'm definitely out there thinking the same thing. Oh, look at that, man. Ludovic Dessin, Simon. He's the one that's definitely been causing a bit of a ruckus for his recent, um, was it recently hired for, what is it called? And Dilemusa right recently a lot of people have been getting upset about that but yeah really great look but anyway um really good collection from jack moose big big fan of it i loved it loved everything about it and i can't wait to see this being worn by the real relatable normies out there as he likes to call them because i feel like they're going to do this more justice than his um stick fin model friends out there but hey maybe that's just me anyway that's been the excellent thing show episode number six two three or is it 621 or 622? One or the other. I'm not too sure. But regardless, you know what episode you're listening to. Hope you've had a good time. As per usual, if you want links regarding myself and what I'm get up to, make sure you click the link in the description, agostinozinga.com. That will take you to everything concerning me, agostinozinga.com. Everything containing me will be on there. Links to social media, links to previous work, links to YouTube channel, links to DJ mixes and gig listings, which have been absolutely dry this year. So, hey, what can you do? But all that stuff you want to see more, definitely definitely check out my site and you can find them all on there if as per usual if you're listening to this audio podcast you hear my tune of the day if you're watching the video portion of it you won't hear any of that thing at all and it'll just fade to black but i'll see you guys again very very soon take care be well peace